Exactly. All right, so we are gathered here today to discuss a very important topic, internalized ableism very. at work. Mm -hmm. Brain Club, of course, just to get us oriented, because uh, we've got some new folks. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, new folks, returning folks. Um, Brain Club is our uh, very intentionally created education space for purposes of providing education about ABB's approach to neuroinclusive community culture to bring people together to develop a shared interest of what's possible and to contribute to systems change by promoting new ways of thinking and being. Uh, then we go out into the rest of our lives and that's how we believe that we will collectively change the world. This is a place that we hope uh, you're, you'll feel safe. It's a place to experience how culture can be different. It's a place where uh, we can collectively learn and unlearn together. Um, and although All Brains Belong has a lot of different types of programs that serve a lot of other purposes, uh, this one is for education purposes only. This is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. So it's not a it's 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 not the right place to you know address individualized or personalized needs or um it's it's uh, for education purposes only. We do invite you to explore today's big picture theme of, of internalized ableism and in work and to share ideas or reflections related to that topic. All paths to participation are okay and welcome. You can have your video on or off, and even if it is on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to sit still or look at the chat um, or, you know, Look at the chat, look at the screen, look at the chat. You don't have to look at anything. You can feel free to walk or move or fidget or stim or eat or any of those things, any of the things that need doing. And you're welcome to communicate however you are most comfortable with mouth words in the chat. Um, you know, you're welcome to send private messages or questions in the chat as well. And in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, in order to make this safe for all participants, we do prioritize the group's collective needs over that of the individual and just be mindful of language used and everyone's access needs. Access needs, of course, are anything that is required to meaningfully or fully participate in one's environment or community. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs. And whether that be related to the physical environment, emotional, communication, interpersonal or social, all different types of access needs. So um, uh, we, we think it's important to like, um, if you've not heard that term before, uh, you'll probably hear it a whole lot today. So we wanted to introduce that concept up front. Speaking of access needs, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot, dot, dot and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to open the chat box. So I actually see it if anybody's using it. All right. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking Speaking of the chat, the chat is a great example where sometimes we have conflicting access needs, where two people's access needs conflict. So for many of our community members, the chat is a way of, you know, being able to actually access this program, to be able to communicate without mouth words, uh, to get your thoughts out in real time and not have to, you know, burden, burden working memory when working memory is short. Also allows for more processing time and more um, rapid fire interactions. And for other community members, the chat is uh, visually cluttered. It is distracting. There's even a really dysregulating startle response to pop-ups, especially when it moves fast. So um, our best advice to navigate conflicting access needs, if you're someone who the chat bothers you, um, try not closing the window. Let it pop up once, but leave it open so that it doesn't keep popping. It'll just, the, the, the words will change, but it won't pop anymore. Or you can try disabling chat preview um, by clicking on a little up arrow next to the chat box. It'll default to show chat previews with a checkbox. You can tap on that and it'll take the checkbox away and hopefully your chat preview pop-up things won't happen anymore. All right. Um, and uh, how we do questions at Brain Club. You can ask your question in the chat um, whenever you think of a question and we'll, you know, they'll be handled by some member of our team today. Uh, we will save time at the end uh, for, for, for some selected questions. Um, as we continue together to unpack internalized ables. So um, before we launch into our topic, 
um, just uh, announcement. We have a special event coming up in a couple of weeks, um, a free webinar, practical strategies, delivering neuroinclusive health care, um, something for everyone. We've got um, uh, suggestions, uh, strategies for clinicians and for patients for like what you can ask for to navigate healthcare experiences. Um, so, so it's really about bridging the double empathy problem because um, clinicians and patients often don't speak one another's language. So we're gonna try to, try to um, represent both views and provide some useful content to hopefully um, improve the healthcare experiences of neurodivergent people. All right, with that, we begin our conversation. So we've been talking about internalized ableism all month. Um, so ableism, of course, being um, just as all of the various isms, the, um, the, the discriminatory belief that it is superior to be able. And this can be intentional, it can be unintentional, doesn't matter. Um, it is the whenever we're in a situation where we've got a viewpoint where one group of people is believed to be superior, that is not how we build a socially just society. Um, and so what we've been talking about all month is when you grow up in a world getting messages about that, naming that, um, not surprisingly, many of us internalize that. What we don't want, we don't want a life where people are shoved into containers that don't work for them. Um, we want instead to be recognizing barriers to access and learning how systems um, are thwarting people when we can recognize that um, and learning about ways in which the environment and routines can be adapted to bridge barriers to access. And so with that, um, I am thrilled to welcome back to Brain Club Annie Crow, um, who is one of my one of, one of my favorite people, um, who we are so excited to have back um, uh, joining us, um, and uh, and and actually, Sarah, I forgot to send you this. Um, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up while we're talking. Um, uh, Annie was oh, was gosh. with us maybe about a year ago. Um, yep. Maybe it's about June or May of 2023, so it's been almost a year. So welcome back. Um, so Annie is a proud, multiply disabled Australian human rights lawyer specializing in disability rights. Um, Annie is also CEO of NeuroAccess, which is a consultancy focused on building equity and accessibility for neurodivergent people. Annie is a globally recognized thought leader on neurodiversity and speaks regularly at national and international conferences on topics of neurodivergence, disability rights, mental health, and advocacy. Welcome, Annie. Thanks so Thank much you. for being here. Thank you. I like the my power pose photo. Have anyone totally. seen that TED talk? We've got to love a power pose. <laughs> and yeah, uh, no, um, many of you might have, if you've listened to Princess and the P, Mel came on last year um, to talk about long COVID in the autistic community as well. And that's a great episode. Um, one of my favorites. Mel knows that I'm her biggest fan. So great to be back. And thanks for joining us. An excellent topic <laughs> as well. One that's not talked about enough in this space, actually. Yeah, so um, you know, what, I I wonder for you, um, yes. what does this topic mean to you? Yeah, so so much of what I do is focused around teaching. Like, so I kind of have two clientels, right? I've got my neurodivergent clients who I help with self advocacy, very much focusing on helping them understand themselves and then communicating that and their needs to others. And then the other part of my audience is like more professional who want to, you know, be allies in the workplace and just understand neurodiversity and neurodivergence. Um, and so for the neurodivergent group, which is my favorite, um, so much of what comes before you even get to the point of being able to self-advocate is to truly unpack your own obviously a neurodivergent identity, but also the internalized ableism that we all have living in a very ableist society. Um, because in order to 
find your voice and speak out for your rights and your access needs, you need to believe you deserve them. And that's such a, like, it sounds so simple when we say it like that, but it's actually really difficult. And so much, so many neurodivergent people have such trauma from living in a world where they're gaslit and dismissed and harmed, um, mostly towards when they've shown their neurodivergent traits, right? So for me, a, a addressing ableism on a systemic level, but also in very much an internalized level is critical to being able to really properly advocate for your needs or your child's needs or whoever, your colleague, your employee. Um, so yeah, I think it's like, it's just fundamental. And unfortunately in the conversation around neurodiversity at work, it tends to be a bit of a forgotten topic because it's a bit sticky and people, you know, people don't like talking about racism and sexism and all the isms, which are so critical to it talk about and we've all got internalized versions of all of them just by existing in this world um so yeah did that answer the question yeah right I mean so this is this is so deep this runs so yes very deep like, like even as a person who spent like I spend all day talking about this like you know whether it's in a you know a medical sense or an educational sense or whatever um I, I, like even as a, as, a, as a late identified neurodivergent person I spend like a lot of time thinking about this right but even even me it's still there and it creeps up and you it, it when you're in it it's hard to match. It's hard to match that pattern of like, oh yeah, that's my internalized ableism again. In the moment that feels, that, that feeling of like, I'm not worthy. I don't have value. This thing is my fault. Why can't I just do the thing? It's, it, it's like laid down in early childhood. So deep. And it's so sneaky. <clears throat> like I'm years down the track now of you know, unpacking my own neurodivergent identity. I don't think we have an end, to be honest. Um, but I think, you know, it's been about five or six years for me. And still to this day, I'm unpacking my own internalized ableism. Like I was just in my therapy session yesterday talking about, um, you know, impulsivity because I tend to impulsively spend. And my therapist who uh, is incredible, but I've done a lot of work training them to understand neurodivergence. <laughs> And it's paid off. They're incredible now. And most of their clients are neurodivergent, which I'm so happy about. But, um, you know, she said to me, like, can we reframe it? Why is it impulsivity? And why are we not looking at it like, you know, your brain needs more dopamine than the average bear, right? And that's not a failing on, that's not a moral failing because the impulsivity to me, and I'm a military brat, so discipline is like everything to my family background. And the opposite to discipline is impulsivity, right? So it's such a, it's such a, a hard point for me emotionally to deal with. And it it's something that I hold a lot of shame about. And when you shift that perspective of understanding, it just makes it so much easier to tackle whatever barrier you're up against for that. And ableism, unpacking internalized ableism isn't about, you know, throwing your hands up and saying, you know, I'm so different, the whole world has to change for me and I don't have to do any self-work. It's actually about understanding that your self-work should be self-directed and it should come, a, come from a place of self-love and self-compassion and self-worth, which so much of it usually doesn't just because of our trauma histories. And Equally, then, understanding that, yes, the world is not set up for you, just like, you know, if everyone was autistic or ADHD, we wouldn't have this problem. The neurotypicals would be like, oh, I, I have access barriers, <laughs> right? Um, so it's it's a balance. And some people, I don't know whether, you know, it's the black and white thinking, which everyone says is an autistic thing, but I think all humans have very black and white thinking. Um, but it's this mixture of uh, understanding that we need to, reframe our, our self-knowledge and our self-awareness while also where we fit in this world that is inherently unequal and inherently inaccessible to people with our brains and bodies. Um, I feel like I went on a bit of a rant there, but anyway. So I, I guess my point is that a lot of my clients want to know, like, what's the secret to unpacking internalized ableism and overcoming it so that they can, you know, move on to really honing their self-advocacy skills. And for me, 
I make a point to let them know that it, it's an ongoing journey, just like trauma healing is ongoing as well. You know, you don't just like fix trauma and it's never there again. You're always going to have triggers. You're always going to have it sneak up when you least expect it. Um, and that's something that I think is important to know from that angle of ongoing you know, self-acceptance and self-compassion when that stuff arrives, because it will. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of, you know, in, internalized ableism at work, some of the biggest issues that I see coming from mostly late, later diagnosed um, autistic ADHDers tend to be that they don't think that they're disabled enough or that they are bad enough, quote unquote, to deserve accommodations or to be taken seriously when they ask for supports. Um, and that breaks my heart, uh, but I also understand where that's coming from because we've spent our lives being told, you know, you're too sensitive, you're too much, you're too this, you're the problem, not us. Um, so it makes sense that we're having those views, right? And the systems, like the systemic resources that are supposed to be there to provide support um, they tell those, they send those messages too. Um, you know, you're, you, you, you don't qualify for supports or whatever, because you're not, you know, severely impaired enough. Like, like it's, 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 it's coming at people from both directions. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And so, you know, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle, but, um, one of the things that, you know, absolutely fills my heart with joy. I'm just, about to finish one of my um, group coaching programs. The current one is, I call it DAG, because I am a DAG, but it's disabled and gifted. It tends to be, um, you know, twice exceptional autistic ADHDers. And people have opinions on giftedness, but let's just sidebar that for now. Um, and it's incredible to see the transformation. I have, it's eight sessions over about um, three months. We really space it out. And just from the beginning where they, they come in thinking like, do I really fit this? And, you know, I don't really understand what my needs are and how do I communicate them? And then by the end of it, all of them being very much coming from a place of, wow, I truly deserve help. And now I feel empowered to ask for it and get it. And to see that take action in their lives is just why I do what I do because it's just so empowering and my previous life um the last 10 years before I started this work um I worked in more traditional human rights roles in both um private and public sector and it was so disheartening to see such a late response to addressing any sort of um barriers and and discrimination and I, I went to, I spoke at a, I spoke at our national, Australia's national um, suicide prevention conference last May. And um, I was in a session listening to this, these policy people give a talk. And it's the first time I heard of the concept of upstream and downstream suicide prevention. So upstream being, you know, let's help them before they even get to the point where they're in crisis and downstream being when they're in crisis, help immediately. Right. And so I kind of call myself an upstream human rights lawyer now because I'm doing work. That's the goal of my work is to make sure that people don't ever get to the stage where they need to go to the courts or our human rights, you know, our systems set up to help us that don't help us a lot at the moment. Um, you know, because once you get to that point, things get really difficult. And unfortunately, where we are right now in time where people are just beginning to understand the complexity of neurodivergence, especially in a disability context, our systems are not strong right now. We don't have a lot of precedent and case law and things to really protect us fully. And I get so many messages from people going through the court system or human rights commission, um, or in Australia, we have a thing called the NDIS, which is the national disability insurance scheme. Um, who are trying to get more help. And so what I try to do is help people, obviously those people definitely need help too, and I, I do help them sometimes, but I want people to get to a point where they, first of all, understand themselves and their neurodivergence before they hit breaking point, because how many of us were only diagnosed or identified when we were broken, like beyond, yeah, like that disgusts me. 
I said to my my son is three and I said to his educators last year um, that I, I'm sure he's autistic. His father and I are both ADHDers and I'm like so proud that he's showing very clear autistic traits. And she said to me, oh, I don't see any red flags. I'm like, no, you wouldn't because you only understand autism in a pathology format, right? I, I see beauty in his pattern recognition and his love of rep like repetitive behaviours and um, his different approach to socializing and he's it's just beautiful and so joyful for me but there's no way he like me would be identified as a child because he's he was fast to walk fast to talk he's you know but how does that make make it so that he shouldn't understand his divergence in a way where it does get challenged and this is kind of why a big part of the people who tend to come to me for help, tend to be um, either high-performing, gifted person, like people who have almost high, and I'm not like, I don't like comparisons. I think every human is gifted, right? But these are the people who have like the highest level of internalized ableism because they've been told their whole life that if they just tried harder, I mean, most of us have, right? You don't have to be gifted. And gifted doesn't mean you're a diagnosed gifted. You just know that you're switched on like, I honestly think anyone who's late diagnosed is gifted because the gifts tend to hide a lot of the struggle. We tend to be really high masking. We tend to be able to like f be more chameleons and fit in and and disguise our, our needs. And that has its own set of barriers, right? Like masking is a privilege in the sense that it can mean that you have less harm um, because you're not blatantly discriminated against, but it's, it's at a cost. Masking takes a huge amount of energy and spoons. If you understand spoon theory, um, it, it's, it really eats away at your identity because you think I have to be a different person to be accepted. Like that's just icky. Right. Um, and so even though masking is a privilege, it's also an absolute burden. Um, and we shouldn't have to. Absolutely. And I think that it's also really important to, to note that, um, the, the, the cost, and we we had a, a webinar, it was a community panel of, of multiple EBB community members talking about their experience of um, learning about, unpacking the journey of internalized ableism. Um, and what many people described is the idea that you, you, you maybe were, quote, able to do the thing, but at a cost, like what you're describing, and that, you know, from the outside, people would not no, they would not have guessed like what was what was the internal experience like right and especially when we think about that the dsm5 criteria for autism those are autistic stress behaviors mm -hmm. um so depending on how dysregulated you are how stressed you are um you're more or less likely to manifest you know stereotypical presentations from from the outside and i think it's also really um in, in, important to 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 name, you know, because I think people um, mm. unhelpfully use the term, you know, fun, you know, like talking about functioning labels, right? And so I think it's really important for any autistic person, whether they've experienced this or not, um, any of us um, could decompensate and need a lot more support, and mm -hmm. any of us. You know, I remember around the time I got my autism diagnosis, I like lost the ability to motor plan brushing my teeth. Like my motor planning just fell apart. I that was I I lost that skill. Um, so I think I think that and 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 you know anyway, I think that's important to name, right? Because I love there's that. Yeah, no, I, I think that is so important to name because first of all, we don't like functioning labels. Um, I don't find high and low functioning very helpful, but a lot of people will substitute that with high low support needs, which is better, but they still don't really articulate the fact that it fluctuates, right? Right. The, the yeah. No, like I actually had an email. I had a message on my website recently of a mother asking me, um, you know, my daughter's been diagnosed level two or three. Um, does that mean she always will be? And I'm like, no, but also like, it shouldn't matter. <laughs> like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a level one or a level two or a three, you have support needs. Um, a lot of that is is that that system we live in, that policy element of, you know, how much are we really willing to listen? But I, you know, I was diagnosed as level two when I was in full blown autistic burnout. But 
on a day-to-day -day basis these days, I probably fluctuate from a level one to two support needs, depending on a lot of different factors. And that's another thing that I really work hard to help my clients understand is that just because you can do something one day doesn't mean that it's not an access need still, right? Because the next day when your supports fall out from under you or you have extra, extra um, demands, whether that's sickness or parenting or whatever work, all of a sudden that isn't accessible to you anymore. And I think what's really hard for neurotypicals or, or people who don't understand this space, not necessarily a lot of neurodivergence as well, um, to understand is the fact that just because you can do something one day doesn't mean it's not real. So it's just like, for example, from a physical disability element, you know, if we see someone who's um, in a wheelchair some of the time, do we then think that, that that's fake, right? Like just because they aren't in it full time, um, you know, we all have fluctuating access needs and support level needs. And, and there are just so many different factors that influence that that most are absolutely out of our control. So it's so important to understand that no matter what level you're diagnosed as, it it's not a hard forever thing. It might be from a policy angle, from a, a legal standpoint of what your diagnosis is, but from a understanding yourself and actually deserving your needs to be met, it's pretty much irrelevant and it shouldn't matter. Um, I'm also as loving as all as the comments and I'm trying to multitask because they're so great. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, we're, I'm trying to respond. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Exactly. Kitty, we'll take we'll take questions in 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 a, in a little while, but feel free to to ask some questions yes. in the chat, and we'll, we'll um, go through. Mel, them. I did okay. see a comment that I thought we we should address because we've talked about this before, and again, it's such an important topic. Um, I'm trying to find it. Okay. So Martha wrote. Privilege is a trigger word for me because I have never felt privileged despite being white, American, et cetera. My life is not as an autistic sucked. Um, first of all, sorry, Martha, and totally get you. And, and I think this is something where, you know, people are, are we're really at a, a state in the world where we're just starting to talk about privilege and oppression in a much more like frequent manner and people are starting to grasp the concepts more. And, you know, just because, you know, my son is a white Australian male, so he's not even a woman, uh, gender binary, like, um, you know, obviously on the, the privilege hierarchy, men, women, all other genders, um, but privilege is so complex and intersectionality is so important to consider as well. And it doesn't really matter if you have every privilege in the world in terms of, you know, maybe you're white, you're male um, or female, um, you know, high socioeconomic, all, um, all those things. If you're, if you're neurodivergent, that in itself means that you are in the 20 odd percent that we know of, of not being privileged like the majority neurotypicals are. Okay. So it, and it, what it means is that you know, if you've got someone next to you who has less privilege, let's say, um, you know, they're from the BIPOC community as well as being neurodivergent, then yes, you do have more privilege than them, but it doesn't negate your need for support and the reality that you have faced oppression. Um, and I just think that's important to mention because a lot of the conversations in the privilege space is very like comparative and, uh, you know, you should speak less because you're white or whatever. And, Absolutely, we need to acknowledge racism and sexism and ableism and every type, every form of oppression. But that's not to say that anyone who has more or less privilege doesn't still deserve support right. and, it, you know, to reach an equal footing in society. Absolutely. Um, we, we did a book chat on um, the book Autistic and Black um, a few weeks ago. And I think some of the really right. So like the like some of the really important things um, that 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 came out of that discussion at, at Brain Club were around that that like not not only do we need to understand experiences that are different from our own, um, and it's it's the idea of thinking about intersectionality like like really holistically in terms of there are things about our identities or you know our various aspects of our identity that have some privilege and some aspects that have some marginalization 
and yeah, it's the way that these things these things interact so so yeah. if i if yeah and so sierra sierra saying uh, much more articulately what i was just saying oh about yeah that's not that it's it's not like an all right, or nothing thing here mm, yeah any so so if we could circle back around um to, yeah. to work when we think about fluctuating capacity dynamic disability um you know a lot of you know in a lot of times what 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 happens in in the folks i support is it's like well what am i supposed to do for work sometimes i have more capacity and sometimes i have less capacity and how the heck am i supposed to work because i never know how much capacity i'm going to have on a given day what do you say when you're supporting folks in that situation oh that's like the big question isn't it it's so hard because i mean all workplaces are different and there are some out there that it tends to be the more smaller businesses, to be honest, that have a bit of a more flexible attitude, yet they don't have necessarily the funds to accomp- to make more accommodations. But because they're smaller and more intimate, um, I see a lot more like compassion and empathy in the workplace than the bigger corporates. Um, so I'm in two minds about it, right? So I'm obviously self-employed now and I've given up working for anyone else because that just did not work, no matter how hard I tried and different ways I, I attempted that. Um, that's not to say it doesn't work for some people. I have many clients that have found successful employment um, and have found workplaces that are so supportive. But a lot of it will come down to, um, you know, where do you work and are they willing to support your need for flexibility? Um, and I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this example of a client I have that is a parent of an eight-year-old boy. And this is about school, not employment, but I think it's a great example that we can use in employment. Okay. So this little boy went to a school and they were just putting up walls constantly saying it was all too hard. They didn't want to accommodate any of his needs, uh, autistic boy. And I was helping them, the parents advocate for him at school. And it was just going nowhere, which is rare and frustrating for me. <laughs> so I said to them, look, I think we've hit a point where we need to acknowledge the fact that this school is just not going to budge and you need to move to another school. And so in the workplace, this would be like your employer, you've tried to self-advocate, you've you know tried to fit that system and it's just not budging. Maybe it's about time we find a different employer, which again is a privilege. Um, but they did that and the school that they found was incredible and immediately started listening to their needs and allowing this boy to do school from home on Wednesdays and to the point where he no longer had any school can't or we we call it school can't but other people say school refusal um and you know one day he woke up on a Monday and said I just can't go today mum and the school said the mum's contacted the school and said look he's struggling they said that's fine does he want to come on Wednesday this week instead like that kind of flexibility is phenomenal because most of us, as Mel knows, and one of the reasons Mel and I connected on a very deep level, uh, you know, two years ago is that the complexity of our health, our physical health is also a big element. And so it's not necessarily just that maybe our, you know, one day our focus is really good and the next it's not. It's, you know, we could have chronic illness flare ups. Um, a lot of us need to look into things like pacing, if that's accessible to you. And a lot of these things require flexibility and an ability to be quite autonomous in employment. And so obviously that tends to be easier in self-employment because you're your own boss, but there are so many complicating factors with self-employment around, you know, you've got to have a much wider skill set. Um, you've got to have money and there's so much more barriers in that sense, even though that can be really a good option. And I see a lot of people take that option the other side of it is if you're in mainstream employment is finding workplaces that are willing to listen and they are out there. I know it seems like it's hard to find, but they absolutely exist. And I'm hoping that it becomes much more broadly accepted as we push towards a lot of corporate places. Now seeing neurodiversity as an aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging, D E I B acronym um and you know finding uh employer that and it doesn't necessarily have to be the the actual corporate employer it can just be your boss because your boss or your supervisor is probably your number one relationship in terms of any like most of your accommodations 
obviously they have to fit within company policy, but to an extent, a lot of them do have, you know, quite a bit of flexibility. And so, you know, working out some of this is working out what your needs are. So is it, is it the fact that maybe you've worked out that, you know, you can't work a set schedule. You need to have that flexibility of, you know, maybe you do a certain amount of hours a week, but you need to have more control over which days you do it on or how long your days are or whether they're from home or at work or partially. It, it, like there's so many different factors and a lot of this ends up being a very much a, a bit of an experiment because um, I think a lot of people think, you know, I'm going to, I find out about my neurodivergence, I find out about my access needs and I advocate for them and it's done. That's just not how it works. <laughs> it's this big ongoing journey and process. And, and I definitely recommend getting support from, you know, your psychologist, your occupational therapist, advocacy people like myself, coaches who can help you through this because it is pretty complex, but, you know, going to your employer and being safe enough to have that conversation about what you think you need and them being, you know, enough of an ally to help you experiment with it because you're not going to find the right fit straight away. Um, I mean, if you are, that's great. You're lucky, <laughs> but most of us don't. And it is very much a, a place of, you know, if we think about masking, for example, um, unmasking is easier to do when you're with safe people and you're in a safe environment. So if your employer feels like a safe person, like a safe like space, you're more likely to be able to have those conversations and feel empowered to try and figure out what works for you. If they're not, and it's toxic and unsafe, and you're feeling high levels of discrimination, ableism, all of those things, then you either keep fighting that brick wall or seek outside help to do it or move on and find a better place, um, which not all of us can do. Absolutely. Um, and it's, mm. it's, it's challenging, right? Because um, it, I, 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 I think what we, I think what's a struggle for many people. It's like, yeah, I, I wish I could feel safe, quote, on masking. It's like masking is a survival strategy. If your limbic system is giving you cues that this is unsafe, it's because it's unsafe. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think that you know when when if people are receiving cues from the environment to show up a certain way, not show up authentically, that's not a safe environment. Definitely not. And it's not necessarily just about your supervisor either, because you can have the greatest supervisor in the world, but if you're in a toxic team or you have um, you know, colleagues that are not so safe and not so, you know, accepting, then it can just be as big a battle because, you know, you might have a supervisor who allows you to make a lot of accommodations and adjustments, um, you know, the legal term, reasonable adjustments, um, but your colleagues might then start treating you poorly because they think you're getting some kind of advantage or taking, you know, taking advantage of the system, which we all know is rubbish and their ableism showing. <laughs> right. Um, but it's absolutely true. So there's so many factors in deciding like, you know, what to do in terms of the workplace. And I think, you know, it is a big journey in terms of first really understanding your flavor of neurodivergence, which we, everyone's different, you know, the saying you've met one autistic ADHD person, you've met one. Um, and on top of that, understanding the fluctuating nature of our support needs, and the complexity that most of us do also have chronic illnesses or physical disabilities to go with it. Um, and then being able to actually advocate for them and find safe environments where you feel supported, like truly supported. Um, and, and that can be like, you know, I, I feel like sometimes when I say that, people think they've got to go into this workplace that's like the most neurodiversity affirming workplace and they don't tend to start off that way. Like there, there's more of them coming, but you can go into a workplace that has no idea about neurodiversity, uh, but still is willing to be an ally and to learn and to really commit to trying. That's just as powerful and you can make such a big difference in those spaces. And sometimes that can even be better because they don't have a lot of like any preconceived ideas about, oh, the new thing is neurodiversity, right? Like 
Um, and in, in fact, so All Brains Belong has a, a program uh, called the Neuro Inclusive Employer Bright Spotting Program, where people can nominate their employers locally who are creating workplaces where people with all types of brains can get their needs met and, and, and et cetera. Um, so what we do is after they nominate a, a given employer, we contact them and find out what they do. Um, so in the past year and a half of running this program, um, only one employer has ever thought about neurodiversity. It wasn't, that's not something they set out to be or do. What they all have in common is they're like, oh yeah, like people do things differently. We should like let them. Yup. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, I, I have this, I'm still like workshopping how I teach this, but I have this like picture of kind of like a color spectrum line. And um, on one end of it, it's like preferences and the other end of it is needs. And so, you know, in when I teach my self-advocacy workshop um, and a lot of what I'm trying to teach people is like start, okay, maybe I'll take this back a step. I did a great podcast episode two years ago with Amanda Morin, who's American. Um, and we talked about the workplace and, you know, she, she loves using preferences and she thinks that everyone in the team needs to talk about like their communication preferences, which I agree. It doesn't matter if you're neurodivergent or not. Right. It's a great way to start building an inclusive culture that doesn't need labels and that sort of thing to be like, Oh no, I actually need this. But it, at the time it got me thinking like, but it's more than that. What if you start talking about preferences and then they're not taken seriously because it's just a preference, right? It, when it's actually a genuine access need. So what I when I talk about this visual, I talk about starting down the end of the preferences and testing the water to see the reaction you get from colleagues, employers, bosses. If you're getting a positive attitude towards testing what your preferences are, then it's likely going to be safer for you to up it a bit in terms of starting to talk about access needs. If you're immediately getting pushback talking about preferences, you know there's going to be a bit more of an uphill battle to fight for your access needs, right? And and the reason I say this is because people can get quite defensive and and sort of put back if you just I think you know run in and say oh, I need to work from home or I need these hours. These are my access needs. Bang, bang, bang. You have to meet them. A lot of people's reactions to that is going to be like, oh God. Whereas if you start off going like, I work better if this is done or I, it's my preference to use email rather than phone calls um, and sort of slowly build that. And that can be a really, you know, and I'm also thinking from a space of like, let's minimize trauma, right? So like, I want us to have as little trauma exposure as we can, because we've had enough of it. Right? So if we can do it in a way that we can test that water and see who the safe people in the safe environments are and build up our trust levels, which we all know is an ongoing process, then that, you know, that's sort of my approach to how I teach people to go into their workplace and self-advocate because it tends to get such better responses and I've seen it in real life, people coming back to me saying how it went. And you can just tell the people who get that great response from the preference discussion do tend to go on and have great success in that workplace. And the people who get pushback usually end up leaving that workplace because it's just, it, it gets too complex. It's a poor fit. It's a poor fit. Um, and it's remembering that I think what you described about, you know, you go in and you name the thing, even though it is your right. And even though it is true, it is actually a need and not a preference, presenting it as such tends yeah. to result in the other person having a limbic response, an involuntary automatic limbic response. And so I really appreciate your phrase of like, my goal is for you to have as little trauma as possible. And yeah. it's then it, then it's not masking. It's more of no. a like an intentional code switching of I'm gonna say the thing to get the thing I I want. I, yes. I'm gonna say the thing to get the thing I need. Right. You know. So if yeah. we're gonna take you know e even you know in a neuronormative capitalist thing, you know, I, you know, I'd be a lot more productive if I can yes. wear my headphones. Is that cool? 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Productivity. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that. I, I mean, um, yeah, I love. Yeah, the productive. Because Sierra's coming. Yeah. Productivity. Yeah, I love. I like one of my special interests is productivity, and they all talk about removing the friction. And for me, so much of what I teach about neuroaccessibility is removing the friction to existing as a neurodivergent person in this world, right? And the difference is, is that productivity is just about optimizing and accessibility is about equity, right? And actual accessing. So it's more of a must have than a nice to have. Um, and that's like reframing that language. But one of the things that got me talking this way as well is that there's been a huge amount of interest in like unmasking, you know, everyone read, you know, Devin, um, Price's book, Unmasking Autism, last year, which was great. Um, and I've always felt, you know, I'm I'm a PDA, um, pervasive drive for uh, persistent drive for autonomy or pathological demand avoidance. Um, and I hate the fact that people are like, you have to unmask. And you know, like there's this pressure to unmask, right? So many of us don't have the privilege of being in safe spaces to unmask, whether that's our community, our family unit. There can be a lot of intergenerational trauma because neurodivergence tends to run in genetic lines. And so you can imagine that there's generations of people who have been very much shoved <laughs> with internalized ableism that can be even more toxic than the outside world. Um, so I personally don't like to focus on unmasking in the sense that it's this like ultimate goal. Like, yes, unmasking is great. And, you know, we should all live in a world where we can unmask, but the reality is that many of us don't. And so it's really, instead of thinking about the act of unmasking, it's thinking about trauma reduction and it's thinking about safety, which I think is so much more helpful in terms of we already put so much pressure on ourselves. And this is, this is where a lot of the internalized ableism can come up, right? You know, try harder, be less sensitive, be whatever. We've got all these messages can you imagine then adding that demand of, oh, and also unmask, like, you know, you're autistic or ADHD now, you have to unmask. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> it's actually okay if you don't feel safe to unmask. Maybe you do have privilege in terms of having workplaces or families or communities where you can unmask and you still don't really feel safe to. That's also okay. But yes, harm reduction is everything. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> and I think it's just much less of a pressure in terms of putting the responsibility on us to show up in a world that is inherently unsafe. You know, it's, we need to shift that responsibility into the environment, into society, into our workplaces. They need to take action. You know, we're, we're so, we've been talking about physical disability for years. I think the stats are like 90% of disability is invisible um, or, you know, non-visible, whatever you want to say, but We'd, like we've come so far in understanding physical access needs in terms of building ramps and elevators and all these things, but we are barely, barely giving birth to understanding invisible access needs, let alone neurodivergent access needs, right? So Absolutely. this is such an important space to really understand what world we're in and how you can play a part, not only in your own life, but in a broader sense, because I also like love helping people who are keen to do systemic advocacy or community advocacy as well, because we need more of us. And most of us are so low spoons <laughs> that it's hard. It's so hard. I mean, even myself running my own business, uh, Mel knows this, I've, I have a lot of health problems and chronic illnesses and they flare at different times. And, you know, I'm lucky because I can be more flexible with my schedule a lot of the time, but it's still difficult. Um, in terms of just feeling like you're never going to succeed because you're never going to have this consistent effort that's going to build and build and build because you just don't know what's around the corner or what's going to hit you next. And I think that a lot of you might be able to relate to that on an everyday level. And especially one thing that I used to struggle with most in the workplace was when I'd have to take time off work, it became this huge deal of, you know, you need medical certificates, you need you to use your leave. And when I ran out of sick leave, I used unpaid sick leave. That's fine. But now I go to the doctor when I'm sick and they're like, do you want a medical certificate? I'm like, nope, because <laughs> I'm the only one that cares. And yes, I don't get paid for sick leave, but the lack of stress 
in terms of having to explain to people why I'm not just getting better or, you know, maybe I need to like move better or eat better and, you know, it'll fix all my problems because there's always that pressure of like, you're doing this to yourself rather than the reality of actually uh, most of it's out of our control. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm ranting. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, you know, um, there's a question in the chat, how do we manage and navigate ableist attitudes from workplaces? And I think for, for me, um, mm. that is because of this involuntary automatic limbic response. When someone tells you you're doing it wrong, that's not the way that, 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 that I do advocacy. There are people like, I'm glad some people like do that. Um, but but it's the um, it's it's the inclusion I think that in for workplaces that um, at least on their um, purport to be interested in inclusion um, you know neurodiversity and access are generally missing from the business conversations on um, DEI B right and so like naming that but this is just a missing piece of the conversation and these are things that benefit everyone. Um, and that when employees get their needs met, they are actually less likely to quit their jobs. And, you know, econ you know economically, the employer benefits from yes. the employees Retention, not quitting their job, productivity, right? loyalty, trust. Mm -hmm. You're going to get such better output. You're going to get great employees. You're not going to waste resources trying to constantly recruit because you're not having people staying because you're a shitty employer, <laughs> you know, there's so many benefits. I never focus on the benefits. Cause I'm like, this is just like logic. Right. People. You do it this way. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like doing yeah. the oblique angle thing. Right. So it's yeah. like, there's multiple ways to advocate. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I agree. I agree with Kitty's comment. It's quote, it's so unfair um, for us to have to leave a job because of the unjust behaviors of others. And I think like in a setting of limited capacity, it's very hard. It's almost like, you know, it's, it's work, it's school. Like, do I have capacity to fight this battle or am, is, 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 is like, actually, am I going to spend all of my spoons fighting? Um, like, is that actually going to get me closer to the thing I want? Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes yes, sometimes no, it totally is unfair. I totally agree. Do you have anything else to say about that? Oh my God. So unfair. And I'm trying to multitask because I'm still reading comments. <laughs> Yeah, that, um, that, that, that's what I was doing when, when you were talking. I mean, I, yeah, I was yeah. Chat yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's um, it is. It's really unfair. And I was just reading the comment about like capitalism failing us and stuff, and like yep. that's so true. And at the same time, we're not going to be changing that anytime soon. Like we live in a capitalist society. Yes, it's shitty and it has a lot of problems. It also has a couple of benefits. Not going to go there, but you know we can't really do much about that right now. So like focusing our energy on how we can adapt, you know, make capitalism work to our advantage in terms of understanding how the system's working and what our, what our rights and uh, what our rights are, what the policy is, you know, it's the reality that we don't live in an ideal world, but we are in this world and we have to kind of find a way to, it's not accepting it and just going, oh, you know, it's it's too hard, it's not going to work because, I mean, that's just not acceptable, right? <laughs> I don't want to get depressing because that's depressing. But there's definitely ways to work within that system. And, you know, the advantages of capitalism, like, you know, and again, not pro-capitalism right, at all, but if we look at healthcare, just for an example, uh, Australia has great healthcare. You know, we've got Medicare and we get so much covered or rebated, unlike the US who, you know, you guys do not, you guys are just thrown under the bus with healthcare. Um, but innovation is much higher in US healthcare, right? Because mm -hmm. it's pushed by, you know, it's, they want to, companies want to earn money, want to be the best. Hold on. Hold on. I don't think that we need capitalism for no, innovation. No, I don't either. I, oh God, I no. think that I think community <laughs> is where innovation comes from. I think you I bring people together, you find out what their needs are, you put yeah. in, you, you recognize, especially like part of unlearning internalized ableism for me is, is, is someone coming to learn that they have a gift, that they have something to contribute, something that is valued by other people. 
Yes. Um, it's not about how much you produce and what totally you sell agree. and what you make, right? It's like I yes. have this offering. I show up. I have value because I show up as my true yep. self. I mean, and we do all in have inherent value. And I guess so. My example for that was not to sell capitalism. It was to sell the fact that we can use that system to our advantage. Like we can understand that that's currently how things are operating, and target that kind of approach of you know, okay, so we want this outcome of supporting our communities who we know hold inherent value and need support. And you guys want to make profits and innovate and all that. Like, let's try and get them to pay attention to our space, which is so often forgotten for their, you know, their own sort of selfish reasons. Anyway, I don't know if this is coming across right, but I'm not, I just, my point is it's just from an advocacy, systemic advocacy level as well, is to, you know, rather than, I see a lot of people just online going, you know, capitalism's crap. And I mean, yes, it is. But I think what's that um, Churchill quote about capital, um, democracy is the worst form of government, but it's like what we have, whatever. Um, it's not the quote. <laughs> I think like we need to be shifting ahead to how can we still change the system as it is today? Like, if we currently live in this society, what can we do to shift it towards that space that we, the, our ideal space? Yeah, democracy. I know this is getting negative, Martha. Yeah, yeah. Well, hold on, hold on. We got one minute left. We got one minute left. Yeah. We're gonna oh, spin no, it around, oh, no. Right? We, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to spin it around, right? Because <laughs> it's, it's how you make this work is you connect with other people. Because when you connect with other people who are navigating this, um, that's the like it's not a fast track, but it is a, a faster track, right? To navigating these broken systems, right? Because yes. at least if you can, like you're in this terrible situation, if you can at least not shame yourself while it's while it's doing it, if you can see when someone's shaming you, like, oh, that's, that's, you're shaming me. I, like the idea of like sh spotting shame as opposed to feeling shame, like those are two separate processes that make a really big difference. And I think, so I think, I think community, whether it's like community mutual support and, you know, like needs and offerings, like, you know, just parallel play with the broken systems to right. me, like that's. And that's, just finding yeah. people who fundamentally get your struggle, who have lived it, who you don't have to explain it to. We spend so much of our lives explaining to people out there in the world what it's like to be us. And to, to, and this is why, you know, I love Brain Club. It's why I've started my neuro access network having community where you can just show up authentically as yourself and get the genuine support from people who might not be the same as you, but fundamentally get you and come from that place of compassion and can build that support is just priceless. In my opinion, <laughs> we need more of it. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you to everyone for being part of this conversation. Um, and, uh, what are we doing next week? Anyone? Hold on. What are we doing? What's next week? Um, hold on. What is next week? What's happening? <laughs> um, it is. Oh, um, Alexandra, while you look that be... up, Alexandra asks if there's free stuff. Yeah, there's, um, I mean, there's lots, I have a couple of free, um, Facebook groups. Um, I think just look up audio, I, well, you can find on my link tree, but, um, audio HD, or autistic slash ADHD women or autistic ADHD adults, parents, something like that. Um, I ha I don't do much in them, but they're a beautiful space that people can join for free um, that can support you in this journey. Um, so there's lots that isn't paid as well. I think th the thing for me, the difference between the paid communities versus like free Facebook groups, for example, is that um, depending on who you're paying tends to depend on like, their level of safety and education and stuff. So, you know, I get messages from people who are in the communities of other advocates and other creators and stuff who get told, tell me that it's not safe and they're not moderating and all this stuff. Whereas for me, the reason I started the Neuro Access Network, which is about to go open to the public, it's currently just my group um, participants. And I'm sure Mel is, feels probably similar, but it's... um. I wanted a space where people just knew they'd be going to get support with my own values and beliefs. So, you know, if you 
I've, I actually, I don't even go on many of the Facebook groups ever anymore because so many of them are people who have barely started this journey, who have so much internalized ableism, who can say such harmful things or such, you know, old school thinking. And so for me, it's about creating spaces where you can show up knowing that you agree with that line of thinking and you know that that's going to be a safe place and person and community for you to fit. Um, anyway, just on that last note. Awesome. Um, thank you, Annie. And uh, I, I, next week, we're going to be joined by another guest presenter. We're doing a book chat and the Ooh. author is coming live. Um, so uh, Tomatoes and Peppers, a metaphorical tale for anyone who cares about kids. Um, Matt Mulligan Ooh, that. Um, is, uh, is the, and, and what the book is about, um, the, the book is about, it's really like the, the, um, the, uh, the analogy of like, as we're saying, people, uh, people grow up being told like, you know, just, you know, do the thing, suck it up, do the thing. It's in gardening, right? You don't like put the tomatoes with the soil that the peppers need and be like, go ahead, grow. It's like, well, you you actually, the, the outcome of growth is based on the environmental conditions. Why do we know that with plants? But we, we like forget that about people. So that's what that book is about. It's really cool. Yay, that sounds great. <laughs> awesome. no, thank you so much for having me. I love joining thank your you. awesome brain club. And thanks everyone from all over the world for hanging out with us today. And all the awesome comments and questions. It's been fabulous. Awesome. I only get Thanks up for you people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. Take care. Thanks. Bye. No worries, guys. See ya.